Um, so my research is about the crime against humanity of other in inhumane acts and more specifically on how we should understand the act of causing serious injury to mental health. From the outset, it was always clear that crimes against humanity were intended to be able to evolve in order to include newly emerging atrocity crimes. And this has become particularly clear when we look at the residual clause of other inhumane acts. So, therefore, all international criminal courts have jurisdiction over the, uh, the residual clause of other inhumane acts that are of a similar character and intentionally cause great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental and physical health. Nevertheless, there exists considerable ambiguity about the meaning of causing injury to mental health due to the, the subjective nature of mental health and the fact that it's um, sometimes more challenging to establish than physical harm. And in this presentation and in my paper, I try to give an overview of the case law of international criminal courts, such as the ICTR, ICTY, ICC, Special Court for Sierra Leone, Leone and um, the Extraordinary Chambers in the court of, Courts of Cambodia, um, to see how they interpret the concept of causing serious injury to mental um, health. Let me first start real quick with the historical background on the residual clause. So it was always intended that crimes against humanity were, would be able to evolve in order to respond to newly emerging atrocities. And the residual clause of other inhumane acts finds its origin in the aftermath of the Second World War, where it was included in the Nuremberg Charter and the Charter of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, where it was mentioned that other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war were constituted a crime against humanity. In 1947, the General Assembly directed the International Law Commission to um, formulate the Nuremberg Principles so the principles of international criminal law in which other inhumane acts was also regarded as a crime against humanity. And it continued this process in 1954 and 1996. However, in 1954, it didn't refer to the residual clause, but it um, limited itself to, a, to referring to a non-exhaustive uh, list of other any main acts, but it reinstalled the clause in 1996, um, where it also acknowledged that it would be impossible to establish an exhaustive list of crimes against humanity. During the same period, um, jurisdiction was also given to international criminal tribunals over the crime against humanity of other inhumane acts. Um, and while the ICTY and ICTR only refer to other inhumane acts. The ICC statute also establishes already a threshold in the statutes. When we then look at the general requirements for other inhumane acts, we can see that uh, besides the general requirement that it must be a part of a widespread or a systematic, systematic attack, that there are also two extra requirements, namely the first one that it must constitute an act of a similar character to the already enumerated acts in the statutes, and secondly, that it must concern an inhumane act which intentionally causes great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. Concerning the first requirement that it must constitute an act of a similar character, this firstly entails an exclusionary character, meaning that the word other um, means that the acts cannot be subsumed under another already enumerated act. And secondly, that similar character means that the act must be similar in nature and in gravity as the already enumerated act for this uh, ICC is, this, for example, murder, um, torture, and so on and so forth. And the second requirement then is that the act must intentionally cause great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health, which firstly entails that the mens rea means that the perpetrator must intend 
to cause the consequences of serious injury to mental or to physical health. When these consequences are caused without intention, they cannot fall under the crime against humanity of other inhumane acts. And the perpetrator must be uh, aware of the factual circumstances um, constituting the act. Um, whether there is serious injury to body or to mental or physical health, international criminal courts say about that that it's judged on a case-by-case -case basis. When we then turn to the main part of my research, we can actually see that there is no clear definition of causing serious injury to mental health. A trend which is also noticeable when we look at other international crimes causing mental harm. Um, we can see that international criminal courts often tend to focus on physical harm, as a result of which mental harm is sometimes not treated, or if it is at all treated, it's solely treated as an extension of physical harm. While there are some important differences, for example, physical harm sometimes, for physical, to establish physical harm, sometimes a simple visual examination will suffice, which is not the case for mental harm because it's, um, it's, it's a subjective notion, it's dependent on a variety of factors such as age, health, gender, cultural background, religious conviction, um, and when international court, criminal courts then address mental harm, we can see that rather than elaborating on the substance, so for example that they name which mental effects were caused, PTSD, um, insomnia, that they actually just limit themselves to enumerating acts that cause mental harm. So they don't make a substantive analysis. What we do know from the case law is that international criminal courts get their inspiration from international humanitarian law and the law of war crimes, more specifically the grave breaches of willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health and inhuman treatment, as well as the, common, um, the violation of common article three of the Geneva Conventions of Cruel Treatment. And they say about that that they use the same standards, which is again the standard that it must be an act of a similar character and the act must cause serious suffering. The next thing that they mention is that to, us, to see whether what mental health, an injury to mental health has uh, taken place, that they apply a factual assessment where they look at the nature of the act, the duration, the context, the repetition, the personal circumstances of the victim, and the mental effects on the victims. But as already mentioned, actually, they don't elaborate on the substance of the mental harm. As regards the duration of mental harm, they, the International Criminal Courts mentioned some abstract um, stuff like the harm does not need to be permanent. Um, however, the effect must go beyond temporary unhappiness, embarrassment, or humiliation. And a bit contrary to that, they say that long-term effects are not, um, are not necessary, but they may be relevant in, determination, in the determination that serious mental harm has taken place. When looking at the case law on, on other inhumane acts, I was able to identify four situations, four sometimes returning situations, in which international criminal courts have ruled that there was sufficient um, mental health costs. Um, the first one being is being forced to watch your relatives suffer. For example, in the ICTR case, that was a case about gender-related violence on Tutsi women. The court said that the fact that Seri horrible gender-related violence took place that, that constituted a, um, an attack on the human dignity of the Tutsi community as a whole and that it would cause serious mental suffering to anyone who observed them. The same happened in cases on forced marriage where the women were abducted but firstly had to watch their relatives being mutilated and killed the same decision was reached there. Secondly, um, in 
another forced marriage case, the court has ruled that the fact that women had to marry, that their traditions were not abided to, um, that that caused social stigma, and that it even resulted in them being rejected from their communities, um, and that that this social stigma and being rejected from their communities caused serious injury to mental health. And it even ma made the hypothesis that when forced marriage results in the birth of children, that it would cause really psychological complex problems for both the victim and the child. So here we can see that international criminal courts in some way take the cultural dimension of mental harm into account, but again, without elaborating on it. Third one was also in the context of forced marriage where uh, the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia ruled that the fact that women were not informed of their partner, they didn't know that they had to marry, they didn't know who they had to marry, the uh, fact that they were constantly monitored in order to verify whether um, they consummated the marriage, that this course of environment caused them to suffer serious mental injury and therefore the act of um, forced marriage was also ruled to be another inhumane act. And then the last situation was the situation of destruction of property, and you can notice that I put a question mark there, because in the case um, of the ICC, it was ruled that while there was sufficient evidence that homes and businesses were destructed, that it was not clear that there was sufficient mental harm caused to the victims. However, the court did not rule it out completely, so we'll have to see maybe in the next case. Um, and we know that it has already been recognized by the Iraqi High Tri Tribunal case concerning Saddam Hussein. So to conclude, it is clear that mental harm is a highly subjective concept that is dependent on uh, the cultural backgrounds of victims, their age, their health, and so on and so forth. And that the court recognizes that to a certain extent, and that it says that it will solve, uh, it will determine whether mental health has, uh, mental harm, my apologies, has taken place through a factual assessment. But when we look, to, look into the case law, we actually see that there is no substantive analysis of the seriousness of mental injury by international courts. And we can conclude from that that maybe mental harm is still overshadowed by physical harm. And I think it's important to um, pay some more attention to that because the recognition of mental harm can constitute, um, can help in transitional justice and in collective and individual healing after international crimes. Thank you.